Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here are your hosts, Monica Profit and Tracy Hazard. Hi, and welcome to the New Trust Economy. This is Monica Profit, and I'm here with Jonathan Lapchik. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Monica. As the CEO of Suku World, I'm so excited to learn more about your background, not only as a delight, uh, de- delight, Deloitte uh, consultant, bringing blockchain solutions to all kinds of verticals, but also how you transitioned into food sustainability and conscious consumerism. I mean, those two things seem pretty far off from each other, and it looks like you've taken a leap recently. So uh, I can't wait to learn more about Suku. Can you tell me how you, what, what made you want to start it? So... Um... I'll go back to my days at the doing my MBA um, back in 2012. Um, I went to a class, uh, Professor Campbell Harvey, which is now an advisor of our company, was uh, doing a, a finance class. And that day, he decided to talk about Bitcoin. Uh, so a friend of mine, he saw. I mean, he was all. I mean, I was always crazy about ideas and, and new concepts and new, um, yeah, and new engagements. And he said, "Hey, come, come with me, and learn about this." And obviously, I heard about Bitcoin, but I never understood it. And that was the first time that I really understood what was blockchain, what was Bitcoin, and I immediately got obsessed with it. Um, so at the end of my MBA um, in 2014, I, I wanted to do something with without a session um, and the passion that I had to actually build a product and, and, and make some impact with, with blockchain. So I decided to join Deloitte. Um, I, was, I joined Deloitte as the product lead for the blockchain lab that we had in New York uh, back in 2014 and I helped them for four years, um, connecting with Fortune 500, taking them through ideation sessions, showing them the power of blockchain, how can blockchain could transform their businesses and then building some prototypes and solutions. At the end of 2017, I was leaving Deloitte to create my own, um, to create my own fund. Uh, when I met one of our clients, a company called Citizens Reserve, um, which is the company that I'm CEO right now. And we were helping them design a supply chain solution. Um, and I immediately fell in love with the concept with a team and decided to join them two weeks, uh, two weeks later. So let's just back up for a second. You were approached. It took you two weeks to make this huge decision to leave what you were doing. Um, how did that happen? I mean, what, what, made it, what kind of convinced you this was the time and this was the place? This was 2018. So, I mean, we're start talking kind of some crypto winter at that point. So what made you think this is the time to leave? So first of all, it was the craziness of 2017. So I think it was a good time to take the risk, to take yeah. some risk. Um, and, and I think some, some things, can, I mean, some things you can explain. Like I, I went in, I had, a, I mean, a great connection with the founders. Um, and when we were working at Deloitte, we saw through the verticals, supply chain was the one that we really had the, 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 the most traction, um, because everyone wanted to do something around traceability and it was a great fit, um, with the use of blockchain. Okay, so, said, okay, so what exactly yeah. does Suku do and what is uh, Citizens Reserve actually doing in terms of like a great fit for blockchain and sustainability? That's very high level. What's the, like if you were to tell me in a sentence or two, what, is, what do you do that addresses food sustainability? We connect, we help brands and retailers better connect with conscious consumers through uh, providing more transparent products. And we make products more transparent through the use of blockchain. Um, and what we saw is when you think about traceability, traceability of products, not only food, but any, any type of product, um, gives you the right channel to, con- to connect with this new trend of consumers that are not looking also for the product. They're not look- looking for the flavor or the taste or the color, but looking for something more intangible, like how do they give back to uh, the community? How do they connect with the story behind? How they are... Um, 
um, fulfilling these sustainability uh, initiatives. So that that's the new trend of consumers that that it's growing tremendously, and it's going to be the way consumers are going to be in the next ten years. Uh, everyone is going to be a conscious consumer. Uh, so we saw a huge opportunity to tackle that group that want to buy products, but they don't do it because they don't trust the brands. Yeah. So we create that technology to help the brands uh, connect better with them and. To moving. build an economy of trust, right? Exactly. Yeah, I, I will remove the word trust. I think we we are moving away, we're moving from um, models based on trust to models based on proofs, yeah. um, and and transparency and truth. And that's what we wanna we wanna provide. But I don't wanna trust anyone. I just wanna verify that something happened. And we created technology to enable that. That's wonderful. I mean, it's so funny. I've thought about a lot about this because when we titled this. Um, this podcast, The New Trust Economy, it was like, what well, should we call the new trust less economy? And I thought, well, it is true that in, in action, in function, we're coming to a trust less economy. But what that can produce now is actually emotionally a sense of greater trust in the reality that we have placed, that we put ourselves in, right? So it's so odd that we end up with, with less trust needed. We have more of a trusting um, experience, you know? Um, and not trust based on blind trust. It's actually like knowledgeable trust where you go, oh, I can look you in the eye and I know what I'm looking at. And it's not, it's not only that you've proven yourself, but I now don't have to have this trustless, this untrusting guard about me because I know who I'm looking at. And so in just removing the need to have blind trust, you actually give like a vision trust, you know? It's, it's very strange, but it's, I've thought a lot about what is a trustless economy and what is a trust economy, you know? Yeah, we, we, we made an exercise and I think a good word to replace it was truth. truth. So the, the truth economy, um, because it, sometimes uh, human beings need the trust, need trust to, I don't know, to, uh, um, to trust someone in a relationship or... Absolutely. But, but when we go, like when you talk about business, no, you don't need trust. I mean, I'm buying something. Someone is telling me that something is organic. I don't need to trust you. Just tr prove, prove me that. I don't yeah. need to spend time on, on, on hypothetical cases if I need to trust you or something happens when you're not telling the truth. Right. I just want is to it be really organic? Is it really organic? I mean, at some point, yeah. we've just been taught as consumers, mm -hmm. we just have to trust that it's organic because it says so and we're paying for it, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Or is it coming from this region or... So there's no need to trust um, in, those, in, those, in those scenarios, right? And so we replaced uh, trust with, with truth. So I can think of so many times when I have thought, yeah, right, you know, oh, sure, you're just going to up the price. You know, it'd be so easy to make a fake, so, for example, a fake, a fake um, um, non-blood diamond, right? Blood diamonds are everywhere. How would you ever know that unless you could actually track that? And so I can think of, you know, so many huge verticals for this matter, especially organic food. Um, I personally have a, a, an allergy to glyphosate and that's in almost all of our food in the States. And so if I'm going to eat, if I'm going to bake anything, I actually literally have to go online. I have to go to, I found out that there's two countries that were the first to ban Roundup and glyphosate in their wheat production and therefore in flour. That's um, Germany and France. I have to get French organic flour import it. It's $10 for a little pound. And then I can make my holiday cookies that I want to make for people so that I can eat them and not have a runny nose and hives break out on my, on my, on my neck. Oh my God. I'm this sorry. Is ridiculous, right? So this, I mean, I, I can't eat bread. That's actually not true. I can't eat glyphosate. I can't eat chemicals, but I know also that, you know, I might as well say I can't eat bread because there is no bread in the U S that hasn't been touched by that chemical. So I can't eat bread until I go to France. And then it's amazing. And I love it. I eat so much bread. But, <laughs> but you know, I mean, I personally experienced the, you know, effects of not knowing where something comes from or being the kind of canary in a coal mine to tell myself, oh, it must have had glyphosate in it. Cause look, I'm, you know, I'm getting the runny nose that I always get. And if I do it for too long, I'll have stomach cramps and like actual side effects in my whole body. Right. So I'm sure everybody is negatively affected by this chemical, but I am the canary in that particular coal mine. So I would love to know for sure. So then I can be like, absolutely not to all these brands and maybe be able to identify more that would be good for me, right? So, I mean, organic food and diamonds, but like you say, when you say brands, it makes me think of fashion, right? Because that's usually the first thing that branding is associated yeah. with is the look. So um, in terms of brands and verticals, where have you guys decided? I mean, it's kind of a blue ocean for you guys, but yeah. where have you decided to focus on? We decided to start with food and specifically with meat. Um, so we launched um, our first partnership 
in Latin America with one of the, the three largest retailers over there, a $14 million revenue company called Sengosud. And um, what is it called? Decided, Sengosud. Sengosud. How do you, how do you spell that? C-E-N-C-O-S-U-D. They have like, okay. hun- like 1,100 uh, stores um, with presence in Peru, Colombia, Chile, um, Argentina, and Brazil. They're really big. So we decided to start with, with meat. Now you go to the supermarkets in Peru and you'll see the, the, their brand, uh, Wong Premium, with uh, the packaging, with our logo, with a QR. You go there, you scan the packaging and then you get first of all you get like a video of the farmer where you can see their faces you can actually Aww. create a connection um and then and then you get the traceability so every step like it came here to the market this day then it, from the distributor from the logistics from the processor and every step has attributes i provided um vaccines with no hormones or i have the certificate so everything they say about the product is verified either by someone saying, yes, that's true, or uh, by a document. If it's a certificate that certifies the animal welfare, then you go, you, we don't ask the certificate to them. We go to the certificator directly and they yeah. issue and they, they send us the certification. So <clears throat> at the end, you create value through that. You can actually tip the farmer. And so you go, you are home, you like, the, you like the, the meat, you can actually tip the farmer on the other side. Um, and, and you have a lot of dynamics um, over the app. But that's how we discover that we can fill the gap between the conscious consumers that are looking for something more transparent and uh, their brand that are looking to connect with them and being able to hopefully help with, with sales. That's what we are proving now, that this technology is not about only sustainability and transparency. It's really going to hit uh, targets around sales. They'll be able to hopefully sell more through this technology. So it actually is a, an additional um, advertising mechanism for them as well. It's advertising, but it, it's a tool to communicate the, uh, the, the differentiators of, of their product, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes a product is different than, than the other, and, and it's difficult to communicate a message or to prove uh, different, different aspects of the product. Uh, so we started with that. The idea is now to expand it to uh, fish, chicken, fruits, uh, wine and other categories until we become the entire like the sole verificator of all the products so if there's um, any farm raised salmon you'll be like and here's a picture of the farmer injecting it with something orange yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it, it's it's tricky i mean when you think about cows and all that you don't want to like really really think about the cow so yeah you, you need to be careful with with every probe and what do you want to show how do you want to connect a symbol um, of probe with food but it's going to be furniture it's going to be luxury items so every time that you scan you can see the transparency you can see if it's authentic you can see uh, the provenance but traceability is the church and horse uh, for us traceability is a channel to be able to help network of farmers uh, through financing tools and and tools to give them um things that they're not getting uh today like loans like 20 bucks um loans every every single month through our tool or um and and being able to help these retailers um with the product so we have like these features where you scan and you can get actually a new experience uh we have partnered with a company called dreamview uh where you can get uh the object um like a virtual reality object where you can actually, if, if you're buying a mat, you can see how the mat places on the floor or a couch. So different ways to engage with the product, helping the retailers sell better, um, better sell the product, and also helping these farmers um, through, through the initiatives that we, they were doing around traceability. That's wonderful. And are you, I mean, I hear your accent. I know, realize that you've gone into uh, South America as your primary um, market yeah. right now. Where are you from? And, and is, does that influence like where you're kind of focusing initially is because you have expertise in it? Or is that just, did that happen organically that happened to intersect in such a way? Yeah, so that's a great question. I'm from Uruguay, a uh, small country between Argentina and Brazil. It made sense uh, to go out of um, US at the beginning uh, because of regulations, because it's still like um, difficult to navigate all the regulations around blockchain and, and cryptocurrency. So we decided to start um, in, in Latin America. We had connections there. 
Uh, and it, it made a lot of sense. Like it's a market that really nobody is tapping. It has a lot of potential. Um, you're talking about like converting real users into the cryptocurrency and blockchain market um, and a great opportunity to help them and educate them on, on, on the benefits by giving them a real application, not by teaching them uh, what's blockchain because nobody really right. cares. No one cares. It's like giving them real matter. value. Like do I get value or not? And yeah. if they get value, then they will learn. What is it? Well, you mentioned like cryptocurrency in, in the Latin American and South American market. Um, and I am, forgive me, completely ignorant about what uh, types of laws do or do not exist and if they are more or less or even specifically defined as restrictive or unrestrictive down there compared to the U.S. But, you know, is there, did you have anything definitive to go on or are you just like, well, there's been less out of Nicaragua, so we might as well check them out, you know, or were you just kind of shooting in the dark? Because it seems like in early days with blockchain, we sort of were in terms of what jurisdiction was going to crack down next. But are there certain areas that you found that they've literally definitively said, no, we're fine with cryptocurrency and blockchain technology coming into our supply chain? No, it's still early. I mean, they, they don't have much yet. They're still learning from, uh, from what we're learning here in U.S. as well. So it's, it's more open in the sense that uh, you can play with um, the different different solutions and explore and, and work with the government to show them the benefits yeah. and it's it's easier to to get to those entities right um, by showing them real applications so I think that that's the opportunity like if we have the, the right connections being able to show them a real application working in production with a real retailer um, and that, I think that's that's the opportunity Wow, that's amazing. So what are your next, um, besides, you know, you're going to do other meats, so fish and poultry and whatnot. Are you thinking of expanding beyond food or is this really going to be a food specific, food focused company in terms of supply chain? No, no, we are, we are exploring uh, different use cases. We are uh, finishing now the, the roadmap for, for this year. Um, and yeah, we're opening up new categories, but not only verticals, but also around like different products. Like what are the features that we're going to include in order to help retailers, but also help our farmers and suppliers and, and producers. Um, so it's, uh, we're, we are now have a strong initiative around luxury items, uh, sneakers and, and, and handbags, um, and then also on furniture. So it's across the board. Yeah, it's, it's, it's important to select uh, your bottles, to pick your bottles, uh, because it's impossible to be everywhere. So focus is going to be important for, for this year. So in terms, it sounds like a very hearth and home sort of oriented uh, perspective that you come from, one where it's like food and home items, furniture, things that make, that people touch every day, very consumer focused, you know, everyday use type of, um, what would they, what would we call that in the securities world? Nice defensive stocks, <laughs> right? Yeah. No, it, it's, and, and it's important because we are trying to create a new engagement model, a new way to connect. Sale doesn't stop when the sale ended, it's, it's the sale extends after that. So you can create new channels of communication with the consumer, uh, where if you buy a t-shirt, maybe when you scan a t-shirt, I can invite you to the fashion show uh, live and you can actually get access to it. So I think it changes how um, through, um, through the products, how you connect differently with, with these consumers are looking for something else, not just the product that they're buying. Yeah, that's true. It makes me think a lot about some uh, some cost based economic models that I've been working on. And just because cryptocurrency is the best of take, you know, money in the most basic sense, strip away every regulation or rule that's ever happened to it before and then rebuild from the ground up just to see even just as a as an, as an experiment. But then you can come up with so many more exciting things than just, you know, inflation and inflation proof and, you know, like sort of models where I've noticed that we we have right now everything about our economy is very price based and so the cheaper you can make the price the more you can have this like well just you know continue with your profit as far as you can go but and then you have to completely externalize the way that you can you feed back into your mission so for example if you're a very profitable company but you want to be mission um, mission centric then you have to have a, a nonprofit arm or you have to have nonprofits that you deliver to and you can say you know like at Starbucks you're gonna get a little token and give back to the farmer or give back to the the I don't know sustainable bags that you're buying or whatever those things are. And it's very externalized from the internal transaction of what you just purchased. But if we had a cost-based process, we could actually cap what it is that our overhead is and be able to replenish an ecosystem that's larger with the, re with the remaining revenue rather than always have extended revenue that can then be diffused or have to be then rerouted secondarily. We could actually make only through cryptocurrencies can these things happen because they can be literally money 
that is programmed to do and to respond in a certain way to how it is used and when it is transacted. And so, you know, we really have this opportunity to do so many more engagements that are so much more meaningful and lasting and create actually a circular inclusive economy if we just use the best of cryptocurrency. So I applaud you for having used fiat, you know, in multiple different countries as well as a cryptocurrency to start to get towards your goals. That, Very interesting. that circular well, so, economy is huge. So what, what you describe is, is part of a, an engagement that, that you're in? I mean, it's part of just research or, or you're, building, you're building something? I am researching this now. I'm writing a white paper and I keep anybody who's already talking about inclusive, um, you know, cost, inclusive models, inclusive economic models, and they're in the blockchain and slash cryptocurrency world. I usually go, oh, you know, we should probably talk about this. And, and I've been doing a couple of um, interviews here on our episodes on the new trust economy that are just me talking about an idea. They said, Tracy, my co-host said, you have so many ideas about this. You know, why aren't you just sitting down and talking to yourself? And I'm like, isn't that a weird format for a podcast? And she's like, no, we'll do a few. And, you know, just like start with some of your, some of these economic models that you're working on. So one of them I've decided to have called it the cost-based economic model. And, and I kind of compare it in a very easy digital app, um, kind of as the product to, to show two contrasting views of it. And, um, and I just keep looking for new use cases. And so the first thing you, ha you need to find with a use case, of course, is someone who has the same perspective of like what you're aiming for has the same value. And so if you think circular and inclusive economics is important, then I would, yeah, maybe you and I should uh, have a second, a second episode after we talk about inclusive economics in a more in-depth manner. Can, can I give you one quick idea on, on please, that? On what, please, please, okay, I would love yeah. it. No, something that we're working uh, in Latam also for coffee uh, farmers. Um, so this is a model. Um, you have thousands of farmers um, in Latin America that are in poor conditions, like they don't have uh, really um, enough opportunities. They don't have access to financial tools. And what they only have is just like a couple bags uh, of coffee per, per month. But so through traceability, we are asking them to provide us information uh, because that information is going to be valuable for the brand, the coffee brand. And they will be able to help them connect with the conscious consumer and potentially sell more. Uh, but how do we create the incentive for them to actually give us that information? Uh, so, so we created a, a bot where you, uh, where you send them a text and say, hey, did you sell this bag of coffee to this buyer? And they will say yes. Every time that they say yes, we give them a token. So X amount of tokens, right? And they start accumulating those tokens. Um, and it, that's really valuable information in exchange for tokens, in exchange for rewards. At the end of the month, they can go with a car and go and, and buy products at our uh, partner supermarkets or, or um, with the tokens they accumulated, they can put it as a collateral. So maybe they accumulated 20, 20 bucks um, in Suku tokens every month through the networks that we're connected. And you're giving 10 bucks worth of loans every single month to someone that didn't have access to it, that didn't need to put like a credit score. They just put a collateral based on information that they created based on the value they created. You're changing the lives. Um, so that, 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 that's kind of the initiatives that we, that we look into traceability. Traceability is just a channel for us to help someone Yes. Either a retail brand or the farmer or the producer that we're really interested in. Well, and also you're kind of, um, you're putting into play a very, um, very basic way of, of earning value and, and making and creating value for people that don't have money to invest, right? Passive investment and passive income and passive, it, all these things are all just for the, really the top 1% of the entire world, right? The rest of us, the rest of the world is, is, has to trade a dollar or an effort for a thing always. And so more access points for sweat equity is important. And so what you're saying is, you know, if they're already going to be selling this bag of coffee and all it takes is, I ask you a question, if you answer it correctly, then you get an additional value. It's, but it was off of your, your labor. That's still, um, that's the most, useful economic process for most people in the world is that they can do a thing because what we everybody does have is some kind of time what hardly anybody has is some kind of capital right so it's a I, hats off to you really for for creating yet another economic model that allows people to maximize their sweat equity opportunities that's a huge thing that cryptocurrency is bringing i think to the world we'll love to collaborate with anything that, that i know doing, uh, and the yeah, know. we should. Well, I mean, I don't want to, um, I really don't want to get off topic about Zuku here because this is an amazing episode and I think we should definitely come back and do a second one or we'll talk and we'll figure out if we can do another one of these episodes about a new collaboration in the future. But uh, this is fantastic. I usually ask these uh, a few basic questions of every CEO or like top leader because as um, someone who totally stumbled into being a CEO myself about 12 years ago, um, 
I didn't, I thought of myself more as like thoroughly unemployable, not really like a leader. <laughs> so like CEO wasn't something that I associated myself with. It was more like not wanting to just follow rules blindly was what I associated myself with. And those two things actually are very much in alignment. I just didn't know about the second one. I fell into it by accident. Um, but I, I often thought because I am more of a night owl. Maybe I'm just not cut out for a day job and I wouldn't do well in the professional world. Or, you know, I spent 20 years being a working artist, basically loving Bohemia because there, the rules are so much more flexible there. And granted, the amount of money you make is less, but the amount of time you have is much more. And so I just started to shift my values and my economic system myself and to really maximize on what was available to me and what was valuable to me, which was my time to make things. And so that was great. But now that I've moved into a more professional world where I'm creating things, but I am working within a nine to five scenario and I'm talking to people that have like what I used to call a straight job and I'm a CEO, which is a weird thing to be when you used to be an artist. Um, it's, I have to wonder, you know, I actually, I ask people, you know, what their background is. And you mentioned an MBA that is totally makes sense with what you're doing. I do not have one. It doesn't make sense with what I'm doing. Um, but are you a night owl? Do you find that, you know, are there parts of your, um, habits that either you think really set you up to easily succeed in this world or um, things that you found that you're a little bit of an oddball. So one of those questions that leads that one out is, you know, are you more of a night person or a morning person? And do you think it affects your work style? I'm um, definitely a morning person. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and with two kids, uh, it was, oh uh, yeah, it was even more uh, tough to be a morning person, but it's also tough to be a night person because a night... It's tough to be a person who wants to sleep when you, you, you want to sleep. Exactly. You want to sleep. Um, <laughs> but definitely, yeah, a morning person, yeah, I'm, I'm, the, I'm most productive between 8 and uh, 11. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, no, but I, but I think there's no formula. I mean, coming back to, to, your, to your comments, I don't think there's a formula. Uh, I'm an engineer uh, with a background of MBA, but um, I don't think there's a, there's a real formula for, for leadership and how to execute and how to motivate teams and how to build teams. Um, I think, I think it, it, it's based on, uh, on, the, on the past experiences and based on, on the culture that you want to build. I think culture is, is everything. And, and here we put a lot of focus and a lot of energy on, on the, the, the culture that we want to build for, for ourselves and for the teams. Like we, we come from, the like majority of us come from the Deloitte blockchain lab and we come from these consulting backgrounds, which are really, rigid and structured and so we want yeah. to have exactly the opposite like we want to have like this family like vibe and flexibility and, and leading from the sides um which is not micromanagement is giving the power and the trust which is is the only is the only place where we use the trust here and trust on on team building is important and we give them um enough trust to to go and lead and and own uh, threats and 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 be themselves. I think that's the most important thing is being themselves. The the one reason that I think I was really excited when I came here was that I used to work for consulting for 13 years and I it was never me. It was Jonathan inside uh, the office and someone else outside the office. Yeah. And I just want to be me inside out, like it's just me. I don't want to. I mean, I don't want to have filter. And think about like twice before I say something, and this place gave me that opportunity, and that's what we're trying to build with with everyone that that's joining us. That's wonderful. I mean, it's uh, it's surprising. Well, it shouldn't be surprising, but so many people they don't talk about how the the biggest decisions that they make, like to go lead a company or to go you know make this this shift. They'll say for it made so many sense, so much sense in professional their professional trajectory and in, in those terms. But really, like we're all human beings trying to find where we fit you know, and, and what, what feels good to us and what, you know, whether it takes proof or trust or truth or whatever it is to feel that relaxation of like, I'm not getting screwed over I, and this is reality and, and I can trust it and I don't have to question it. I mean, we all sort of want that and we don't want to feel like we're always in a filtered place of, you know, saying what we don't, what we don't actually mean or having to make duplicitous or un, ungenuine you know, moves every day. But unfortunately, hopefully it's dying, but the the you know traditional business world seems to require a bit more of that. So it's nice to be in this position where I get to talk to a lot of fellow CEOs that are off doing their own thing and 
it's it's pretty pretty common that we're the ones that are like, I just when I got a chance to jump ship, I did. <laughs> I had to go. <laughs> so <laughs> congratulations. So um I guess what other new, you know, big things do you guys have coming up that we can talk about that I can I can let people know to keep an eye out that's coming up with Zuku? No, we're launching a couple other uh, partners that are coming in the pipeline um, and a lot of features that, that we're building uh, in the background. So hopefully we'll be able to, to announce uh, some, some, of, some of those. But we have a fully functional product already live, already in production with a real uh, partner. And yeah, looking to, uh, to enhance that and replicate it with different uh, geographies and different, different partners. That's fantastic. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much for making Thank the time. No, um, we've actually, me. I mean, usually we only spend like, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes on an episode. They're like, keep it to 22 minutes. That's how long the average commute is. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are at 40. So thank you so much for taking no, the time. Thank you, Monica. It's been great. Yeah. And um, I guess I can't wait to do another episode with you once you've uh, got a few more of these of these incognito launches out in the world. It'll be great to catch up with you again in the future. So thank you so much, Jonathan. And um, I will catch you next time on the new Trust Economy. Take Lovely care. To meet you. Bye bye. Thanks. You've been listening to The New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring The New Trust Economy with us.